Hello. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha to everyone. Wow. It's such a, a banquet of connection. <laughs> so take the time, your time to um, see everybody if you want on the different pages. It's good to see everyone so much. <laughs> Looks hot in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> can tell what people are wearing <laughs> where it's hot in the northwest yeah maybe the east coast let's see yeah yep east coast wow oh uh. wherever you are, collecting your awareness. If it feels warm where you are in the Northwest or Southwest or wherever, just feel, be aware, notice, the physical sensations of the warmth and any mental sensations corresponding to the heat. And some of you are in early morning in Asia. It might be a, a cooler 80 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Notice how the skin feels. And notice internal temperatures, warmth, coolness. variations within the body. The 
and begin noticing how your breathing process affects the phenomena of temperature changes. And if as a result of awareness of breathing, you feel the calming of bodily formations or the calming of mental formations. Observing this free of any manipulation, identification, it's the elemental play, it's the temperature as it happens, the breath as it happens, and awareness as you direct it. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what we choose as our home, our primary meditation object. It can be the awareness itself. Sounds. all the phenomena that provides a steady or consistent presence. Or when the practice is agile, it can be the symphony, symphony of phenomena, sensations, sounds. thoughts, the breath. Zeroing in on one phenomena as it shifts, changes, passes away. Receiving the arising of another phenomena, a breath, a sensation a sound moment, thought formation. Overall, the aim is an initial a calming of the system, regulation, a gentling and stilling It is with this serenity that insight awareness works most skillfully in attuning to moment to moment nature, arising, existing, and vanishing. In particular, emotions, strong thought formations appear. 
try to locate it in the body, that particular manifestation of emotive nature, the thought impact, and feel where it leaves correlating sensations in the body. As a way of the ongoing gentle observing power of the heart, free of identification or attachment or of proliferation that is making a story of the thoughts or emotions, just letting them be, live out, live out their short nature. how they affect other sensations, as when you throw pebbles in a pond, other mental formations. Our practice is a lot about honing the way we receive and feel the stream of experience of reality that is felt sense nature. not to be dismissive of thoughts just because they arise. Many thoughts are not distractions. Their responses are little clarifications. They're sometimes just gentle little nudges to keep the stream of silent awareness protected. So just regard all, all phenomena, including our own thoughts, as having arisen due to conditions having a short or slightly ongoing function and then dissipating. The attitude of gentleness at the forefront, side by side with mindfulness, a very skillful companion.
Thank you, Steve. I um, like the idea of moving from the uh, gentle companions of the Brahma Viharas uh, to my talk, which is about the gentle companions of the Brahma Viharas and the Vipassana mindfulness practice. During the retreat, we just taught uh, the nine night, 10 day retreat we just taught. I, I was struck again by how um, powerful it is for all of us to learn the flexibility of um, the options of the loving kindness, the compassion, the empathetic joy, and the equanimity um, that, that can really go along so beautifully with our mindfulness practice, <clears throat> the Vipassana mindfulness practice. And, you know, we can talk about how <clears throat> a mindful awareness is an awareness that's infused with wisdom or understanding. And that, for example, a, a metta uh, awareness is metta is love or loving kindness, but it's a particular kind of love. It's love infused with wisdom. And so, you know, that you can just see in that kind of definition or, or explanation how powerfully intertwined um, the effect of them are for us in our practice and our understanding. So the Vipassana of um, being with the nature of how things are, that, that there's a kind of... Um, being with, flowing with the nature, the moment to moment experience of what's happening at our six sense doors of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, <clears throat> bodies and all the body sensations, thinking, emotions. It's um, this, this uh, particular quality of attention that we bring to our moment to moment experience. Uh, th this is the attention that's infused with, with, with wisdom. And often I think when we attempt to do that just straight up Vipassana practice, what we start to um, come to grips with is that our conditioning is so much to judge our experience our, our condi and this is not I'm not saying that's bad or wrong but just the 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 um that instruction to just be with our experience as it is and then to see how much we're wanting to um, control our experience or fix it or manipulate it uh the levels of indifference to cruelty, to dissatisfaction, this, um, that that can be so overwhelming for so many of us that having the option to notice what's appearing, but to be kind or to <laughs> care about pain or to appreciate joy or to have this deep acceptance of things as they are, the equanimity, um, the, this, this flexibility that can um, bring such, like not just, you know, the, the gentle companionship, the, the support for our practice uh, to actually be able to be th with things as they are, including all this cruelty, indifference, judgment, right? You're not trying to get rid of it as much as to see through it. To, to not be caught in it, to, to not be at war with whatever's appearing. So we can be kind to the judgment. We can be compassionate for the cruelty. We, it's like that level where we just don't have to be at war, whether it's subtle or not subtle, that there's this shift to understanding the possibility of peace and contentment. So 
so the motivation for practicing the four divine abodes, the Brahma Viharas, the loving kindness, the compassion, the empathetic joy, the equanimity, um, <clears throat> as well as the Vipassana mindfulness practice is that we see that they soften the heart. They, they not just soften the heart, they soften the mind, they soften the body. And it, it's this, particularly the learned resistance to pain and, and suffering that, you know, that fear or the aversion to, to pain or the resistance to change, the resistance to delusion, the resistance to confusion, the resistance to greed, all of the, these appearances. Um, again, uh, can become so much more uh, workable for us. We can get a relationship with them uh, of understanding and wisdom rather than uh, thinking we're finally going to get rid of them. And then we'll be happy. So I, you know, I think that um, The Buddha taught uh, Loka Dhamma, the way of the world that we all um, face as, as human beings. So the pleasure and pain and gain and loss and fame, disrepute and praise and blame. Um, I was really looking at the praise and blame recently as, as sort of just noticing our internal thought process and just I don't know how much praise you have for yourself and your internal thought process but if you just look at praise and blame and just like and just look just without without having to fix it or judge it but just to kind of see you know how good a coach we really are for ourselves you know or for others it's like where is all this blame blaming blaming ourselves blaming others uh for the pain in the world and, and so that just to see there's an internal process that we can start to have more and more um care compassion equanimity kindness with that again softens the heart so that we can see them clearly and they actually do appear and disappear very quickly just like a sound if we're not bothered by them if we're not buying into them if we're not bothered by them if we're imperturbable they're no problem sounds right sights smells taste touch thoughts emotions they are they are appearing and disappearing it's only our interference that makes them stick around Okay, so an, another um, reason that we practice the, these um, Brahma Viharas with the Vipassana practice is not only that they help soften the resistance to things as they are, and then we can we can actually be mindful. Um, they they often help us heal disconnect. It 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 might seem like a similar language languaging, but it's it's another way to talk. It's another angle to talk about it, which is that um, when you again start paying attention to when we can connect and sustain the attention with something, and then when we can't, often there's a learned disconnect, often with pain. So say shame came up or happiness, you know, so, so just those two words, shame or happiness or <clears throat> disappointment or joy, uh, compassion or cruelty. It's like we look at these, these um, the pleasure and pain in the mental states themselves or emotional states themselves and just explore it. Just see like, where is that knee jerk disconnect and dis you're just leaving? we leave 
And, and so often if the option is just, okay, I'm just going to nail this, I'm going to show up for this shame, but it, we're using our willpower and there's no kindness. It's not very inviting, right? It's not very inviting to like explore something really painful in the body and mind. If there's like this kind of kamikaze willpower to nail it to just laser beam on it and not really want to learn and to really want to get a relationship with it and want to explore it. Yeah. It's just, you see how it's not, um, it's not possible. But then when we see that this, it's like, to me, it's like, um, if you wear tie shoes ever <laughs> and you get a knot in the shoelace you know it's that the knot of the resistance of the disconnect it's like the kindness or the care or the tenderness you know it it, it doesn't have to be an intense awareness it can be very nuanced very gentle in fact it requires great gentleness you know you can't soften a knot by tightening the knot. It, it and the tighter the knot, the more you know how it takes that, you know, <laughs> if, you're, if you're impatient, it just, you might as well walk away from it for a while, right? And that's what we teach. You hear us kind of bend over backwards to say, you know, if you can't be with it, if you're just tightening around it, if you stay with it, it's gonna reinforce the tightening around it. And it's, it actually reinforces the Brahma Vihara, it reinforces loving kindness or care to switch to something else that's easier to be with for a while. That flexibility, it's like the bamboo flexibility where we shift and it, it's, um, that also reinforces the equanimity of impartiality. That, that we're not trying to say, well, this experience is more worthy of our attention than this experience. It's much more learning how to um, see that when we feel that limitation and the mindfulness actually can't be there and the gentleness can't be there, then shift. Like that it's okay, it's not a failure. It's not a defeat. There are plenty of other things to pay attention to that we're not that good at either or that we are good at and that we're supposed to be strengthening both we're supposed to be strengthening what what is easier for us I think that was the biggest um, revelation I had when I first did the metta practice at, you know as a long retreat was just seeing that oh you know, this is like by by moving to something easier when I couldn't be with the difficult, that it was actually strengthening the loving kindness. That staying with it, with this, like trying to ram through and fix it and, you know, just not explore it, but just think that that was a way to the endurance test to do it, that that was actually cruel. I had a um, injury to my body re recent last month, and it's it's been really intense pain, uh, particularly lying down and uh, not sleeping very well, and watching that place in myself where I can be with it, be <laughs> be with it, and then um, at, there'll be this moment where I'll be like, actually, I want to sleep. <laughs> I don't want to be with this anymore, but I can't necessarily sleep. But seeing how, okay, um, I'm shifting the attention just to sound. And last night, um, I just had this amazing gift where, you know, I live in the desert. And we, for the desert, we have had a very severe drought, very severe. We hardly had any rain this winter. And the, the grasses, usually go from kind of a um, blonde to porcelain white to gray 
in October or, you know, November, it's like the, that feeling of the drought getting more intense, it's natural in the desert. And then, the, you know, you can feel the rains coming in the winter. Well, this year it didn't happen. And so the grasses are like they would be in October uh, or November. Uh, and, and last night it rained and it was so awesome to um, have this option of listening to this um, sound and the, the sense of um, just that feeling. The Buddha described loving kindness as a soft rain. And this was a very gentle soft rain. You could just feel it just gently, gently infusing the ground, the air. My hair felt different, right? My hair, my hair even felt softer. It was just that, and to, to remember that metta is that the nature of it is quenching. We're meant to infuse our bodies, cells, bones. We're meant to infuse thought. You know, we're meant to infuse the whole universe with this beautiful quality of gentle care. There's a poem by Wang An Shi, who lived from 1021 to 1086 in China. This is one of his last poems he wrote in his life. Thoughts as I lie alone, alone. A noon dove calling in spring shade. I lie in a valley of forest quiet. Scraps of cloud pass, scattering rain. And I listen late in life to its clatter, eyes full of red and green confusion, our sad times unraveling my legacy. There's no word near these thoughts, still as Bell Mountain in its slumber. You get to listen late in life if you live long enough to the rain's clatter. Really listen. So sometimes we lean back on time. You know, we sometimes we have to lean way, way, way back and have a kind of um, patience with how things are uh, and a flexibility that uh, I really feel like we're here to learn. We're here to learn, but we're also here to learn that kind of um, almost impossible patience with how things are. So I'm not going to go into it very fully, but I just I wanted to bring in again, like how we're sort of bringing in the Brahma Viharas into the um, mindfulness practice. It's like just to remember that the Buddha taught the four foundations of mindfulness. And so the first is the Kaya, Kaya Nupasana, mindfulness of body. So this is like posture, all aspects of body, right? We have to remember it's, it's um, when we're brushing our teeth, it's uh, the four great elements, the earth, air, fire, and water. Um, it's when we lie down to go to sleep. It's clear comprehension of purpose. It's, it's so vast, Kaya Nupasana. Our bodies are so big. <laughs> There's so much to pay attention to, right? Uh, and there's so much depth within the skin and the organs, the 32 parts of the body. Uh, and so when we talk about the Brahma Vihara, as, as Steve said, that gentle companion, um, sometimes when we do the loving kindness practice, for some people, you know, I was, I'm one of them, I had to really start way outside of myself. 
and bring it gradually in. And some people can start right deep inside the heart and then gradually bring it into their body and out. So like it is like you throw a stone in a pool and the, the water ripples out. It's like you start deep inside and the, the love and kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity ripple out uh, the same, but it doesn't matter. You can start at the furthest galaxy that we know of and start coming in. It doesn't matter because it's supposed to all come out in the wash. So please be careful of thinking you have to do it a certain way. It could be sound, but what we're doing is we're not picking and choosing or being partial um, with um, this part of my body is more important than the frog, right? And this is so important. It's like the, the loving kindness is meant to be going from personal to boundless, including all, all, all it's everywhere. Metta is everywhere. Um, and the compassion. So when I say kindness or metta, I mean also the compassion, the empathetic joy, the, the appreciation of joy. And so that when we talk about bringing the kindness or the care or the tenderness, the appreciative joy and the equanimity into our bodies, we're meaning that we're infusing it, our body like a tea bag in hot water with the kindness, right? And if you can do that once, you can see that you can do that with a frog. You can do that with a star. You can do that with an enemy. You can do that with a friend. This is what the Buddha taught. For some people, the body is too hard. That's okay. You don't have to stay inside the body. It can be sound. It can be sight. I mean, this is, it's again, the, the, the vastness of these practices of just walking down a street. And I mean, one of my favorite things to do is just walk down a street and do metta for everybody in their homes or compassion or appreciative joy. It's, this is somebody in the bus stop. It's, um, a fish. So Vedana Anupasana, the second foundation of mindfulness, that the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling that appears in consciousness every moment with a sight, a smell, a taste, a touch, right? The with the six sense doors. Um, again, it's like, do we really? Remember that sometimes with the Brahma Viharas, again, the gentle companions, and we'll go into this more when we do the retreat in August. So I'm just kind of touching base on it, that that sense of, oh, appreciative joy was something pleasant. So that, that we, we might be eating and something is very pleasant or tasting and it can lead to more, you know, liking, enjoyment, craving, you know, we can not even swallow it right before we're like attached and planning to go to the grocery store to get more or whatever. You know, it's like it's amazing, right? And so there's an option of actually shifting to mudita and just having that appreciative joy, appreciating, appreciating. Or it's very hot, I can see for most people, you know, these days that some people are in Australia in the winter, I can see, but um, just to remember that we can see somebody having a cold drink, or you can be having a cold drink, or uh, ice cream or something, it's just like whatever it is, but just remembering with pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, it doesn't have to be physical can be mental or emotional, can be some moments of compassion, we can feel appreciative joy for that. And then it can be infused into our whole being. It doesn't have to be just stay mental. It can be feeling it within our body, the power of it. 
I think the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, the, the pain in the world, physical, mental, emotional, I'm not going to go into this too much, but a remembering again that option of seeing somebody suffering. Again, as you might be reading something or hearing something or remembering something or having some pain in the body or mind, it's, it's again that option, that flexibility of being able to shift to caring about it. And it feels so good to care about pain. I think this is particularly important for us as human beings on this planet. Just can't say it enough. This is like how important understanding that compassion feels good and how important it is to cultivate it because the pain in the world can just wear you out. the aversion to it, the fear of it, the non-acceptance of it. The compassion is energizing and maybe we taste a little bit of it, that's enough. Shift to something else. And the, um, Third foundation, I'm going, I feel like I'm going too slow. The, oh yeah, I forgot delusion. Wait a minute, there's <clears throat> pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. The um, neutral, again, it, the, to, to notice how we relate to neutral feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, and how it can lead to boredom, indifference, confusion, passivity denial. Sometimes I think that it takes the most compassion for delusion. Because there's often, there's a lot of fear underneath delusion. So again, that wide range of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, and how we apply the Brahma Viharas. I'm just giving you a taste. This isn't meant to be more than just a palette of um, goodness that we can practice. The third, the um, Chitta Nupasana. I've kind of mentioned it in different ways, but when the mind is actually the, the mind, the knowing mind, Chitta is mind, heart, mind, knowing. But it's the mind it, that is colored by something like so colored by angry, anger or colored by sadness, colored by compassion, colored by happiness, all the different ways that, that the mind can appear. And as we can see, any way that we can be kind, care, appreciate, Sometimes I think it's just so powerful to appreciate that our mind functions at all. As you get older, <laughs> you can really start to like grasp how much appreciation that we actually could be having as it starts to dissipate. You know, it's just amazing. Or if you've seen somebody's really go, um, it's powerful to just get that you how much you can appreciate it. I was watching Stephen Hawkins, who died, you know, recent, fairly recently, but just seeing his body and then seeing his mind and what an amazing mind he had, just like extraordinary mind, very difficult body and just the level of appreciative joy I just had, just that we all got to have the um, effect of his sharing his mind, you know, just any way our minds function, we can appreciate any way we can feel compassion or feel happiness or sadness or anger. It's like all the ways that we can feel and think and have equanimity, right? Things are as they are, that range. And then the fourth, uh, um, 
Dhamma Nupassana. I think I always used to think of it as that it's everything else that we haven't mentioned in the first three. It's important, but but it really is like um, the it's mindfulness of phenomena, and it's um, also the key principles of the Buddhist teaching. So it's the four noble truths, the five hindrances, uh, the seven factors of enlightenment, the five aggregates. It go, the, you know, it's like that. That includes. It's so comprehensive. It's the noble eightfold path. It's um, the six internal and external sense doors. It's, it's again awesome. And then the, the way, reason I like this particular foundation in terms of trying to hold that the, it is really how inclusive it is. So that the mindfulness is meant to be able to include anything possible. If you look at the four foundations, you're moving from kind of a human mind when it comes into the world that we're here to learn and there's much to learn and grow into with the mindfulness practice and if you look at how um, exclusive we start how unable we are to have much relationship with what appears to this possibility of being able to have a relationship of wisdom and brahma viharas with anything that appears that's freedom Nothing, no part left out. This is amazing. It's inexhaustible and boundless. Mm, gotta stop. Oh, I had a lot more. Okay. When I moved to Hawaii in 1983, in the first years I was in Honolulu, I learned to um, love shower trees. They're so beautiful they, and that they're really blooming right now. And the, my first ones that I saw were, had pink, different color pink flowers. And uh, they, if you're from the north or like south, far not in the middle of the planet, uh, that they look like wisteria blossoms, not that color, but, and it's a whole tree of them. They're just hanging gorgeous. Um, and my, where I live now, my neighbor has one. It's in between my house and his house. And um, it's so beautiful and um, it hasn't been windy. Okay, so I've had this injury and I hardly get to go out very far. And uh, I walk on my little road, um, I call it my stroll, like I can't really exercise, but I take a little stroll. And when you go slower and you're not moving as much, um, I've been seeing all the petals from these trees all over the road, far from where this next door neighbor's tree is. And I had, I kept trying to understand it, like Sherlock Holmes, you know, like, how is this happening? And it was, I love it. I love it when the petals from like cherry blossoms or anything are on the ground. You know, this, there's that fleetingness of life and the flowers, that, that mortality and the beauty of it is so incredible. So this morning, I bumped into this uh, neighbor that uh, she loves flowers as much as I do, and she makes lays for people. She was going to make 16 lays this morning, and the neighbors all let her go around and pick flowers from their yard, so she had a big bag of flowers. She gave me one, and then I was showing her the petals because she was moving like a normal person kind of fast, and she's like, oh, and I was like, there's been no wind, and then she just went, oh, She's so her husband is a fisherman and he fishes, he goes out at night. He's only he's out all night. It's amazing. And um, he made his own boat, built his own boat. And so she has a shower tree in her yard and he parks the car, the truck under the shower tree and the pedals are all in the boat. And so when he drives along the road, the pedals have all been. <laughs> 
coming out onto the road because it's really a lot of pedals. And I was like, oh, and it was such a moment for both of us of appreciative joy and metta. Uh, and then um, she went off and another neighbor came by and she stopped and I gave her the flower and she put it behind her ear. And I, I know she has some trouble with her body image and she looked in the mirror and she was so happy. And look at how all that flows. That was like 10 minutes of my morning. So if you have any questions about Stephen's instructions or my talk, now is the time. Just if folks aren't familiar, you can um, raise your Zoom hand, you know, at the bottom of the Zoom screen, there's a little button, maybe sometimes it's under reactions. You can raise your hand if you have a question. Um, if that's hard, you can just type into the chat uh, that you have a question. We'll make sure to call on you. It could be about your practice too. Hi, Donna. Hold on, let me. Okay, I think you can unmute yourself now. Yeah, hi. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank you, Michelle, so much for that beautiful talk. Um, perhaps you know in Canada, we're, we're really reeling with these horrifying information about you know, the potential uh, unmarked graves, these, these uh, unmarked graves of, of these uh, indigenous children, <clears throat> 215 in Kamloops and now 751 in another location in Saskatchewan. And it's been so hard to just sit with the, the awareness of this. And, and I find myself, uh, so enraged <laughs> and in, it's going, uh, I'm so enraged with the Catholic church and the Pope who won't apologize and the parishioners who won't be standing up in their parishes and doing something. And uh, I, I feel that some days I'm just on fire with this. And I know it's just that it's so hard to hold the horrifying sadness and pain of all this and uh so i think it was really helpful tonight to really <laughs> think about maybe you know dealing with my inner fire because <laughs> i don't think the the raging outwards is really very <laughs> constructive i have a lot of friends who are catholics and i have to really be careful because it's um i just so want there to be some acknowledgement and recognition and some action that could make so much difference for so many people who are are in such deep horrifying grief so i think you've given me some really lovely tools to uh, 
to uh, work with this. So thank you. Steve, do you want me to start? Or do you want to make a comment? Oh, yeah. Um, Well, I was um, within the Catholic Church for some time as a kid. Uh, I actually got kicked out <laughs> for um, complaining about a lot of things that seemed unjust. Um, but I think that it's it, you know there are ways in which there's a medieval institution that um, with extremely untrained fallible human beings within the leadership and there's levels of uh, behavior that is unacceptable it's, it's so it's so cruel so unacceptable it's um, the mind can hardly wrap itself around that level. Although I think I have to say that at almost age 70, there's a lot of cruelty on this planet um, that it's hard to wrap one's mind around, heart around. And I think that the there's a lot of levels to what you mentioned. And I think that there is a great, um, huge, important opportunity here in Canada for some massive uh, healing. You just pray that it will happen. You know, it's just, there's so much ness screaming for attention here. And um, of course, there are some that are ready and willing and you, you hope there are many more and I, I think I think that um, it, it it's as painful as it gets this this one yeah and I think, and, yeah. yeah so let, let me just finish in terms of that I think that that when you look at what I was trying to say in my talk, that the the Buddha gave us a roadmap that for the compassion that you know if we sink into only the grief or the rage, you know, or the terror, you know, the the level. If you only sink into that, versus see that of course those are a response to such pain that that you can see that your your job your job my job with you is to help you work with your own rage and grief and sorrow and that that's going to be compassion 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 equanimity equanimity compassion compassion change the channel kindness kindness right like appreciative joy you know the map and you know what to do but I think it's just remembering particularly that compassion is gold. It's gold here. And it, it's like, you just wish so many more people knew how to practice this that, and to, to really get that to, to heal this is to care about all these beings involved <laughs> on a level that is a massive, the response could be massive and i hope i hope that you can um, use this yourself as a way to get a relationship with rage and grief and uh, um, find your way to do some powerful relationship building within whatever community you're in you know it's like i think that's that's the short answer i don't know if steve has more to add but it's it's such a vast um situation <laughs> and and it, it doesn't just apply to canada obviously and um 
but Canada needs to rally. And, and it is. Yeah. And, yep. and I think it isn't, it isn't so much because I, I understand, I mean, it, it's, it's not just the Catholic church, it's the governments, it's, it's the other churches. It's that right now, the, it's the lack of the acknowledgement and the recognition by that one institution right now that's been so difficult. But I really appreciate your comments. And I realize tonight I have my own really deep work to do. And our community, I think the whole country's on, is really standing up. And so we're very fortunate. So thank you. Sometimes I wish I was 5 million people and I could go and help all sides of the situation. I feel like I understand now. When I was a kid in, the, in these, um, these situations, it was harder for me to understand how to help all beings in the situation. But now I feel like I do. And it, a lot of it is from the compassion and equanimity practices. And for, you know, the sad part is that everybody involved needs healing. It's not just one side or the other. Yeah. Linda. Hi, Linda. Uh, Linda, you're gonna have to unmute yourself there. When you mentioned, Michelle, about um, delusion carrying a large amount of fear, that, that, that really, um, uh, cause me to feel that that's a piece of, I, I've never really exactly understood delusion to, you know, I understand greed and hatred in a way that I don't get delusion. And you saying that really, um, open something up in me. And I just wondered if there's a little bit more you could say about the fear. And is it a fear of really seeing things as they really are, is what I'm curious about or what? Steve, do you want to start or do you want me to start? I can't hear. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure when you said fear is a part of delusion. No, I, I said um, that off sometimes that underneath the delusion yeah. is fear is fear. Right. Yeah. Not that it isn't fear isn't delusion but that sometimes yeah. it's, it's there, lot, there can be fear right yeah yeah that it well it i think that the delusion will isn't going to coexist with the fear moment to moment but that that often it'll be fear that triggers the delusion yeah yeah the, the way i understand delusion of greed, hatred, and delusion, is it's an inability or, um, or an ignoring of what's up, either an inability because it's so overwhelming, the experience is so overwhelming, 
So we become confused, bewildered, or distracted, or it's just uh, the weight of ignoring what's true. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we see if when there's a moment of crystal clarity in mindfulness or insight awareness, uh, in that moment, any attachment or aversion or fear fall away. And, and, and we can see clearly, we, we can feel, we see the hook where we were attached to a certain view or a certain thing, or we see the anger or aversion or fear where we were repelled by a certain thing. Or we see how those, those were so overwhelming and so uh, intimidating or so threatening that we sank ourselves into an unknowing, an ignoring, an ignorance of, of, the, of the cause of that attachment or fear. So understanding, understanding that is like, well, at, at times we do need the shield. We, we do need the protection. We do need the cover. And then to let a little bit in, a little of a, of a fear or aversion, to let it in to understand it. Not too much, it's too overwhelming. And, and not just take away all, all of the resistance or all of the shields at once, because we wouldn't be able to understand it. But just a, a step into the territory, just take a little bit and, and take it in like a homeopathic dosage and let our whole system then um, regulate that, integrate that. Because the aim is understanding, the aim of our practice, the aim of our Eightfold Path is to understand love and understanding. Thank you. That, that, that's helpful from both of you. And I appreciate that because, yes, because. Thank you. You know, I would just from what Steve is saying and what you're asking, delusion is actually very hard to see. It's much, it, it's much slipperier. It's much slipperier. And in a way, it's easier to see the fear, you know, or whatever's underneath it, but it when it appears, but as Steve said, it, I think there's so much fear often that you do have to take those doses. It's a gradual relationship with it. Confusion is a kind of safe place. You know what I'm, I mean, it's like we all kind of can take, take refuge in it. I remember this movie I saw once where, um, it was about the, the, the troubles in Ireland and uh, this uh, Irish American was trying to understand what was going on in Ireland and asked this Irish guy, and the guy said, um, if, if you're not confused, you don't know what's going on. And I thought that was such a good description of confusion. You know, it's just like, you know, if you're not confused, you don't know what's going on. It's like so good, you know. So if you appreciate that, use it. If you if you don't, let it go. <laughs> it sort of hits certain people and not others. But, you know, confusion is, delusion is so slippery. You have to have some humor with it. It's also helpful to know that that greed and rage exist, uh, can only exist if there's also delusion. You take delusion away, just the love and understanding melt away, uh, sever the conditions for attachment and aversion and anger to exist in the moment. So our, our whole practice in a way is to um, overcome 
the the weight of delusion, the depth of ignorance with the love and the light and the insight of, of wisdom. So we don't need to go after all our attachments. We don't need to go after all our things that we're raging about or angry about. We just need to understand what's happening because each little under moment of understanding and large insight uh, openings of great understanding uh, is what undercuts the hook of the roots of greed and hatred. Hi, Kelly. Hello. Hi. Um, I've just been curious. I, I've, I've heard many teachers talk and in talks there are, um, you know, quotes from the Buddhist texts or stories that are, are related in texts and whatnot, but I don't, I, I feel like I can never recall guidance being offered to explicitly go read and study the text themselves. I'm just curious about, I guess, all of your perspectives on, on where the sort of scholarly study fits in practice, because it's one that I don't hear reference to. I'm just curious about that. It's a great question. Go study, go study. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I don't know if we want to start, Steve. Go ahead. I think it's yeah. helpful in um, inspiration, opening up the possibility, um, getting one started in wondering if there is something that would help their understanding open up or deepen, you know, like to, to lay out the possibility of there being paths, psychological or spiritual paths. In, in that way, I think an initial brush through some of the ancient literature is really helpful. If we've already taken it up, uh, as I think that you're describing, uh, following along on meditative practices and getting guidance from teachers, then I think it uh, supports that and brings clarity to what you've been experiencing or maybe leads you a little in front of what you're experiencing, uh, you know, up to what you're experiencing and suggesting a little more. And then even after you've experienced things to look back to what you've experienced and also get a really a wide range, a wide, a wide view on, on the path and its promise and its trappings um, and its vision and so forth. So with that, yes, I, I think we all support and often suggest resources to accompany the practice, um, usually periods of practice and then maybe some periods of study or side by side, some practice, some study. These are all, all ways I have personally found bene beneficial. Yeah, I, I, I really think everybody's different and some people there, um, I always think that some people that like, uh, can read a lot more of the text and it's like it, it quenches something very important in their minds and um, 
like a, a lot of a lot of textural reading and it's very supportive of their practice and there are other people i'm more the type that likes some of it not huge amounts because i like to i like to read and then practice and but i i actually found my first years of practice i didn't read much because i just didn't want to be affected by i didn't want to read about it so that i would color my practice i didn't want to be um, I didn't want to have the conceptual overlay too much on my practice. I wanted it more fresh than that. But then there was a certain point where I found that bringing more study in was actually helpful. For me, it's around, for me, it's around inspiration. And um, that's my first priority. And then the second priority is really to kind of get an understanding of what the Buddha actually said, or like what we hope he said, or like that we think he said. And there, there's such a range on that level that if you're interested in that, um, we can really help you to find your way with it. We often don't, um, Jesse's writing something now in the chat, but it's like we often, we have so little time with people. We're we're more practice teachers, but we're definitely able to help you with study. And you know, er, like I said, everybody's different. So it just depending on what you want on any particular part of the spiritual journey. But I would say across the board, we would always recommend some study. Whether it's like for me at the beginning, I didn't think it was that helpful, but then after a while, it was like support what I was learning. And then, you know, later, I didn't feel like it would um, affect my practice, <laughs> so I could read more. That's just my type, but other people take in more, and it, it's more inspirational. And within all that, uh, there's such a range of what you can study that um, we're definitely able to help you find your way with it. So I don't know if it's more personal or general a question. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just, I guess it's coming from a place of I, I am of that ilk where I like to read. And, and right. so I've, I've done my own reading, uh -huh. but I was just curious without, without feeling like I hear that often as like a part of practice, if that was an intentional thing or there, there's something behind that, that I was missing. So that's the part I was particularly curious about. But thank you. Yeah. I, you know, generally speaking, I would say uh for myself and you know just looking at steve and jesse they're avid studiers i'm more I'm, i would call myself a little less avid than them but i certainly read a lot of it and i take the amount that i find useful for my practice but also for teaching and for understanding the map i, I wouldn't feel comfortable teaching if i didn't understand the map you know so it's very important, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I think there's some Okay, so I think um if no one else has a question. Okay. Yeah. Hope you have a good week. We'll see you Sunday. Mm -hmm.